So uh, I'm going to spend about the, the first half of the talk uh, doing a couple examples of the Lovaz Okolema, uh, just because I think it's, uh, it may not be familiar to everyone. And then, uh, and then I'll talk about the, uh, the Erdruf problem that I solved using it uh, at the end of the talk. So, um, so the, the lemma goes back to, uh, to Lovash and uh, Erdush, uh, a paper from uh, 1975. It's a lemma from prob probabilistic combinatorics. Um, so the Lovash local lemma is a powerful combinatorial tool for handling dependent probability, uh, and the case for the dependence is local. And it, uh, it applies in a somewhat narrow set of circumstances with surprising results. So um, there are a number of versions of the lemma that I'll state during my talk. Uh, this is the most basic one that's, uh, the, that's applied most often. So let a1 through an be events in a probability space. And uh, I assume that they have a dependency graph. So that means that the, there's a graph g with uh, vertices, the numbers 1 through n, and edges between them. And it's such that uh, a given event AI is independent of the sigma algebra generated by uh, the events AJ such that uh, I and J are not connected, um, don't, don't have an edge. So that's the, the, the nature in which uh, there's a sense of locality. So, so the, um, uh, you have, there's a sense in which you know um, which events are, are independent of the other ones. Oh, that's right. Yep. And then I draw a line between them, or I don't draw a line. What, what's yeah. So um, there are a bunch of events in this probability space, and uh, and then there are edges. And so take a given event AI, and it has some some events that it's connected to. Yep. So here's AI, yeah. and uh, it has a number of. So the idea is that this captures all the all the dependency for AI. So so then AI is jointly independent or is independent of the sigma algebra of all the remaining events. They might have others. Yep, so then there'll be some BJ. And so AI is is uh Oh, that's right. But but for instance, this guy may not be. Yeah. Yep. So that's that's the sense in which there's locality. So I'll, I'll do a couple examples where where that should be pretty transparent. Okay. In any case, so the assumption that that is made is that um, that there's a upper bound on the probability p, so that all the events have probability at most p. And um, so if the degree of the graph times p times e is less than one then you're actually able to conclude that the probability on the intersection of the complements of the events is greater than zero. So, um, so uh, if the events were actually independent, that probability would just be a product of one minus the probability of each event. Uh, but in general, the, the events are dependent, but you have this notion of locality, um, which limits the dependence. So if the dependence is limited sufficiently, then you can still conclude that the probability of the intersection of the complement is not zero. So, so in general, this is a quantity which is is exponential, which is quite small, ex possibly exponentially small, in the number of events. Uh, the statement that I'm giving here is, um, ooh, uh, I'm not sure actually. Yeah, it, uh, it may not be sharp is going to be my guess, but I'm not sure at the moment. Yeah. So there there are stronger versions of the local one. This is this is the one that's most often applied though. Okay, so I'll, I'll I'll do a quick example. So um. So I assume that I have a uh, a collection C of uh, open unit balls in R three, and I'll say that collection is K covering if every point of R three belongs to uh, to at least K balls. And um, and I say that that collection is separable if there is a red blue covering of the balls such that both the red and the blue balls cover. Okay. Uh, 
So um, there's a uh, maybe a, a cult famous theorem of Monte Govitska and Pak, uh, which says the following. So you assume that um, that you have a K covering of R3, and uh, you also s assume an upper bound on the covering number. So you assume that no point is covered more than t times, where t cubed is at most uh, 2 to the k minus 19 over e. In that case, uh, they show that the covering is decomposable, and they also show that an upper bound on t is necessary. So that you can split, it, split the balls into two colors so that both uh, colors cover. So, um, OK, so this is kind of a classic example. Uh, so the, the proof that an upper bound is necessary is, uh, is a difficult geometric combinatorial construction. But uh, the fact that there, that there exists a covering in the case t is bounded has an easy probabilistic proof. So that's what I'm going to show. It's a nice example of a local lemma. OK. So uh, it, it suffices to, uh, to consider a, a fixed box uh, B inside of R3 and prove the same statement for that box, because uh, you can conclude with a compactness argument using Tikhonov's theorem. So we'll say um, it evidently makes it, um, so we, we, we put a con uh, equivalence condition on, on points of R3. So say two points x and y. Uh, within the box are equivalent if they're covered by the same collection of balls. So uh, in terms of deciding whether the coloring is a uh, given coloring is separable, it evidently suffices to consider just equivalence classes. So then uh, color the balls red and blue independently and with equal probability, and let A sub X be the event that a given point X is covered by balls of only one color. So, uh, so then what we aim to show is that the probability of the intersection of the complements of those events is larger than zero, since that will show that there's a um, coloring which is separable in the box. OK. OK, so, so remember that uh, then I made AX the event that X is covered by balls of only one color. So uh, since a given point is covered by at least K balls, and I cover th color them independently, red or blue, with equal probability, the chance that they are a given point is uh, monochromatic is at most 2 times 2 to the minus k. And um, after a moment's thought, you notice that uh, a given if x and y don't have, a, have any balls in common that cover them, then, uh, then the event that x is monochromatic is actually independent of the event that y is monochromatic. So, uh, so a sub x is actually independent of the sigma algebra generated by all y for which, uh, for instance, x minus y is larger than 3. So that means that a, a valid dependency graph uh, has vertices which are indexed by classes of points. Those are my events. And uh, with edges between points that have distance at most 3, or classes that have distance at most 3. And uh, it, it, you can check without too much trouble that the degree of this graph is bounded by O of t cubed, because we're in R3. And so, um, and so you see that if uh, t is O of 2 to the k over 3, then uh, the condition for the Lobos local lemma is met. And you get that the probability of the uh, intersection of the complements is positive. OK, so, that, so that's a pretty standard example of the notion of locality that appears in the local lemma, or, a, or at least a classical example. Okay. All right, so I'll, I'll do one further example, which has uh, just a little bit of history at the Institute for Advanced Study. So, uh, um, so uh, there's a story that uh, that Kastnelson likes to tell, um, in which uh, Erdős posed him the following two problems, which he showed were related. So, uh, so the first problem is as follows. So I'll, I'll consider lacanary sequences. And those are sequences of positive integers, increasing sequences, uh, that have a, a ratio of consecutive terms at least 1 plus epsilon. So there's a fixed epsilon greater than 0, and the ratio of any pair of consecutive terms is at least 1 plus epsilon. 
So uh, a standard example would be like the powers of two, but, but in general, the common ratio wouldn't be the same. And um, so you form the Cayley graph of that sequence uh, on the integers as follows. So two integers i and j are connected in the Cayley graph if and only if i minus j belongs to the sequence. The distance between i and j belongs to the sequence. So the first question is, is the chromatic number of that graph finite? Which means, can you color the integers with finitely many colors so that no two integers of the same color are connected? OK, so that's, that's the first problem. And uh, the second problem that uh, Erdős posed is, uh, is the following. It also concerns the lacunary sequences. Um, and he asks, is there a, for a given lacunary sequence, is there a, uh, a number between 0 and 1 such that if you look at um, the, the fractional parts nj times theta, that set is not dense in the torus R mod z? OK. So, uh, so Castellson showed that the first problem can be reduced to a special case of the second. So, uh, so, I'll, so I'll describe that reduction. And, and the answer to the second is? The, the answer to the second is that indeed, uh, indeed there's always a, uh, a region around zero in which, um, you can't do it. In, in which it's not dense. Yep. OK. So, uh, so, so here's the reduction. So suppose that there's a, uh, there's a, Suppose there's a theta. Sorry. It's the stronger case that there's, al that, um, there's always a theta such that, uh, that nj times theta avoids an interval around 0. So, so that's a stronger claim than, uh, than, than necessary to prove the second problem. OK. So, um, so, that, so that's what I'll assume. So I'll assume that there's a uh, theta between zero, and, between 0 and 1 and uh, some small delta. Such that uh, such that n j times theta uh, fractional part is or distance to the nearest integer is always at least delta, so bounded, bounded away from zero. And um, so then you break uh, the torus R mod z into finitely many intervals of length at most delta and color each a different color, and then you color a given integer according to the color of n times theta in the torus. So, uh, so then you notice that if, uh, if m and n are connected in the graph, then m theta minus n theta is equal to nj theta for some nj in your sequence, and that's uh, its integer part is at least delta. So that meant that the um, the uh, integer part of m theta minus n theta was at least delta, and thus the two uh, the two integers actually receive a different color. So, so this is the part of the story that has some connection to the IES. Um, so, so Yuval Paris and, and Wilhelm Schlag uh, gave the following quantification of, uh, of uh, the, the, the fact that there's always a theta with nj theta bounded below. And their quantification is as follows. So, the, um, so what zero uh, less than epsilon less than a quarter. And suppose you have a lacunary sequence with ratio, common ratio at least 1 plus epsilon. So then there's a, uh, a theta in the torus and uh, a, a some constant so that, the, the, the low, so that uh, nj times theta is bound away from, uh, from all the integers by at least uh, uh, constant times epsilon over log epsilon. So this is the result first proof here. Does theta depend on the sequence? Theta depends on the sequence. C is uniform. But C depends on th on eps. Sorry. Uh, so th there's there's a fixed constant C. Yeah. So the proof uses the Lovasov problem. It, it uses a variant, which I'll which I'll describe in a second. Oh, um, that may be known, but uh, but I don't know it at the moment. Okay, uh, there there may be, but uh, 
I'm not sure off the top of my head, but but yeah, you're likely right. Okay. So there are Castle and Paris and Schleg. Okay, so uh, so their proof used the following variant of uh, the Wolva's local lemma. So uh, so again, I assume that there are events a one through a n in a probability space, and uh, and in this case, I'll assume that for each for each one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n, there's a weight x sub i uh, between zero and one, and uh, and an in, uh, integer m sub i larger than one or at least one, such that the following holds. So um, so. The integer m sub i in this case indicates the the, the notion of locality involved. So uh, so I consider the probability of a sub i conditioned on all events j of all events j before i minus m sub i. So you should think that there are events going on in, in with a history, and you condition if each event there's a certain fixed period you look prior to that you condition on the intersection of the complements of all those events, and then consider the and then consider that Conditioned event, and now we assume that that's that probability is bounded by x sub i times the probability um, sim times the product from j equals i minus m sub i up to i minus one, one minus x sub j. So in particular, x sub i will typically be a bit larger than the probability of a sub i, and it, it'll be larger by a product that involves the events in the uh, in the neighborhood of x sub i. And then the conclusion in this case is that the probability of the intersection of the complements uh, is at least the product of 1 minus x sub j. So are you, are you saying this is another form of, of local robots? Yeah, it's a variant. It's a variant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so assuming the, the proof of their argument, the uh, a sketch of their argument goes as follows. So um, you think of uh, of the events in your probability space as being related to um, to uh, n j times theta is uh, is at most delta from an integer. So that's uh, that you should think of that as a as a signal with a, with a frequency roughly n j and uh, in a small interval of of size about uh, delta over n j. And it turns out that it's a uh, it's a bit better to um, to cover those small intervals with, uh, with uh, uh, intervals of size 1 over power of 2. Um, and so that way, they, uh, they behave roughly like uh, bits. So it simplifies the sigma algebra to do so. So for each. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit lost. What, what are you just, what are you just uh, including that? I've assumed the L, uh, this variant of LOL, I and I'm proving this uh, quantification. Okay, so um, so for each j, I'll, I'll pick a, a, a power of two that's a bit larger than n j, larger by a factor of uh, one over delta, and uh, and I cover the uh, the signal theta such that n j is less than n j theta is uh, bounded is uh, at least at most delta from an integer uh, with intervals of length one over a power of two, two to the m j. Okay, so then if you look far enough back in, um, sorry, so so if I look at at a interval of length uh, one over n j, which is somewhat larger, so you should think that uh, that I've broken my signal into size one over two to the m j, which is quite a bit smaller than one over n j. Then um, if I look in an interval of length one over n j. The intersection with that interval is essentially um, uh, proportional to the size of the interval. So, um, so th this is uh, what tells me uh, how far back I need to decide the locality. So, uh, but uh, maybe I won't say more about this argument for now. If I go back far enough in history, then, uh, then. Then I know that I have an expected intersection with uh, with uh, everything that I'm conditioning on. Okay, so for the, uh, so those are my two examples of Wolva's local lemma, and for the remainder of the talk, I'll talk about the uh, the Arduce problem that I solved. 
OK. So uh, uh, a distinct covering system of congruences is a collection of congruences AI mod MI, where 1 is less than M1, less than M2, to distinct moduli up to MK, only finitely many. And uh, I assume that the union of those congruences is uh, all the integers. It's a collection of arithmetic progressions. Okay, so that, so that, so okay, those a's, the first one would be all the a's plus, plus multiples of the integers times m1, right? That's right. And, and then I add them all up, okay? And That's so right. assume that they cover the integers. That's right. And it's, uh, so I say it's distinct because the moduli are different. And, uh, and uh, just so it's not trivial, I'll assume that the large, this least moduli, modulus is at least one, is larger than one. Okay. Okay. So, so these have a bit of a history. So the history goes roughly as follows. Um, so, in 1934, Romanov showed that integers of the form a power of two plus a prime have positive density, and this is uh, somewhat surprising because if you look at the number of pairs k and p such that two to the k is less than x and p is less than x, that's uh, that the number of pairs is order x. So this says that. Uh, those sums don't overlap all that much. And uh, so according to the history, Romanov wrote to a letter to Erjush and asked him if there exists an arithmetic progression of odd numbers, uh, none of which is the form a, a prime plus a power of two. So, uh, so Erjush gave a construction of such an arithmetic progression, and uh, his, his construction used the following covering system. Okay. So you take the integer 0 mod 2, and 0 mod 3, and 1 mod 4, 3 mod 8, 7 mod 12, and 23 mod 24. And uh, evidently, checking that this is a covering system could have been tested with the uh, residue 0 through 23. So I just have. Sorry, what? So did you, did you stop there? Or yeah, so this, this is the covering system. Uh, it's easy to show. So in fact, each of those arithmetic regressions is periodic mod 24. So you can just check between 0 and 23, and, and indeed all those are covered. Okay. So, uh, so here's the proof of Erdős's result. So you consider x, which belongs to, uh, to the arithmetic progression that I've shown you. So 2 to the 0 mod 3, 2 to the 1 mod 5, intersect 2 to the 0 mod 7, 2 to the 7 mod 13, 2 to the 3 mod 17, and 2 to the 23 mod 241. Um, the relevance of, uh, of the numbers are, the, you should think that, uh, let's see, so you should think that, uh, that 0 is, uh, is the a that belongs to uh, 2. So 2 is the order of 2 mod 3, and, uh, and 4 is the order of 2 mod 5. So 1 is paired with 4, and uh, uh, 3 is the order of 2 mod 7, and 0 is paired with 3. So uh, the a's are the exponent, and the, uh, the moduli are the orders of two, uh, module each of those primes. And so the fact that what, what the covering system gives you is that, um, is that for any k, if you look at uh, x minus 2 to the k, it's divisible by 1 of 3, 5, 7, 13, 17, or 241. So it always has at least one prime factor. And then um, if you restrict the arithmetic progression to a large enough power of 2, you can guarantee that, uh, that x minus 2 to the k is never actually one of those primes. So it always has a second prime factor. OK. So, so what does this, this show in the end? It shows Romanoff's result or what? Um, this gives a construction of, uh, of so, so here's an arithmetic progression. Yeah. Um, there should actually be one further uh, congruence module, a large enough power of 2, which I've omitted. But uh, each element of this arithmetic progression cannot be written in the form of prime plus a power of 2. Because I've shown that if you took anything from that progression and subtracted off a power of 2, you get something with at least two prime factors. Oh, OK. So uh, Erdős had uh, a number of questions that he asked about covering systems. And uh, I'll just give this example, which is kind of pretty. So um, this concerns exact covering systems. And the problem was to ask whether there's an exact covering system 
uh, all of whose moduli are distinct. So a covering system is exact if uh, if none of the mo um, if uh, the sum of the reciprocals is exactly one, or equivalently if the uh, if the arithmetic progressions are uh, ha so form a Okay, uh, sorry. So a covering system is exact if the union, if if the integers are a disjoint union of the arithmetic progressions. Um, and uh, and the theorem is that any exact covering system has a repeated modulus, so it can't be distinct. Okay, so 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 here's the cute proof, which uh, which uses generating functions. So suppose that the integers were actually a disjoint union of arithmetic progressions. Then you could write down the uh, the generating function for the non-negative integers. It's one over one minus z, and that would be the sum of the generating functions for the uh, the corresponding arithmetic progressions. So z to the ai over one minus z to the mi. And in this case, you see that the uh, for those two generating functions to be equal, the poles on the left and right would have to match. But this is only possible if the largest modulus appears with multiplicity more than one. Okay. All right. So here are a couple of more questions about, uh, about covering systems that are asked. So the first one is the one that I solved. So you know, from the 1950 paper, he asked if there's a uh, if there's an m large if for each m larger than one, uh, you can find a covering a distinct covering system whose moduli are all larger than m. And in fact, I showed that that's not possible. So there's an upper bound for m. And the second problem is. Um, does there exist a covering system, distinct covering system, all of whose moduli are odd? And uh, so we have some partial progress on that. So your thing just says that you can find a large enough m so that no matter what, how you choose the rest of the m's. Yeah. I, I cannot tell. That's right. Yep. So I, um, apparently for a, a long period of time, most of the effort went into constructing covering systems. And here are some records for uh, the least modulus of a covering system. So uh, 9, 18, and 20 appeared um, between 1968 and 71. And then uh, Morikawa improved that to 24 in the 80s. And this was improved to 25 by Gibson in 2006. And then, uh, and then Nielsen um, gave a construction uh, with least modulus 40 in 2009. And uh, his construction was noteworthy for uh, for having ten to the fifty congruences or more, yeah, what? having containing more than ten to the fifty congruences. So he just gave representation of the covering system. He didn't actually enumerate it. And then the uh, the main result, which my argument builds on. Uh, is from a paper of Filicetta, Ford, Konyagin, Pomerantz, and Yu from 2007. They showed the following result. So um, in this case, you assume that uh, you have a covering system, all of whose moduli are larger than m, and you think of m as a function tending to infinity. So then they showed that the sum of the reciprocals also tends to infinity as a function of m. I think they had attained a rate roughly log logarithm of m. But Maybe to the one plus little o one. So, uh, so my argument will build on the argument that they gave. So, here are the theorems that I'll talk about. So, uh, any distinct covering system has a least modulus at least uh, ten to the sixteen. And then I have a, a joint project with Pace Nielsen, which we're still working on. But uh, thus far, we've checked that any distinct covering system has a modulus divisible by either two or three. So, um, so we're hopeful that, that that we'll be able to say a bit more than that is eventually. Oh, so I think the largest construction known so far is is maybe forty-two, but unpublished. It was known to me, and uh, if I had to guess, I'm, um, I think probably less than a thousand, but I don't actually know. So, yeah. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll give some of the ideas in the argument. 
Okay, so uh, so I assume m is 10 to the 16. It's a large fixed constant. And I'll assume that you give me a, uh, a finite collection of distinct moduli, uh, script m, and also a collection of congruences to each of those moduli. And uh, I'll consider the unsifted set r. So I think of r as the residual set. It's the set that's left behind uh, when you take the union of the arithmetic progressions that you give me. So uh, r is the is the complement of the union. And uh, the, the argument will be probabilistic in the sense that I'll try to show that the density of R is, is greater than zero. So it won't, um, it, it is possible for me to give some expression for the density that's left over, but it'll be a bit difficult and I'll actually consider some related quantities. So, um, so in particular, um, so let, let me set Q to be the LCM of the, of the moduli that you give me. And then uh, the set R is a, uh, a set which is defined modulo Q. So I'll think of R as, as, contained, as uh, contained in Z mod QZ. And uh, it'll be necessary for me to estimate its uh, density in, eight, in stages. So I let uh, 1 less than P0 less than P1 less than P2 with uh, PI tending to infinity be some thresholds. And I consider Q sub i, which is the uh, P sub i smooth part of Q. So it's the product of all prime powers dividing Q such that the prime is less than P sub i. And uh, then I, um, I put a filtration on the set of congruences. So, um, so I consider R sub 0 a nested set of residual sets, R sub 0 containing R sub 1 containing R sub 2, et cetera where r sub i is the, uh, the complement of the union of those progressions that were q sub i smooth. So, um, Sorry, I, I, I so what, what are the p's again? Capital P. You should think of some of them as uh, thresholds uh, of, of prime thresholds. So, um, so in the first set of moduli, I'll consider only moduli all of whose prime factors are say, so say p0 is 100, p1 is 1,000, p2 is a million, and so on. Then uh, in, the first, in the first stage of the argument, I'll consider only those moduli whose prime factors are all less than 100. And then the second, in the second stage, moduli whose prime factors are less than 1,000, and then those less than a million, and so on. How do you choose the PI? How do I choose them? Uh, well, there's, uh, there's some sort of, uh, it's roughly like a differential equation that runs at the end of the argument. Can you see Sorry? Can you see uh, yeah, it's somewhat like a, yeah, there's, there's essentially a save going on. Okay, so, um, so, I'll, so I, then I will estimate the density of each ri in stages, and if I can show that each r sub i has a non-zero density, then I'll in fact be able to conclude that r itself had a non-zero density because it's only a finite set, and so, so all of its members get exhausted eventually. Okay, so I let, um, I let r sub i be the unsifted set after the i stage, so it's, uh, complement of the union of all those uh, arithmetic progressions with moduli that are q sub that are p sub i smooth and uh, and remember that uh, q sub i is the m is uh, the the p sub i smooth component of q so so um, so those that's a condition defined module q sub i so uh, the argument will eventually be inductive but just to get it, so just to get it started, I s assume that p sub zero is uh, is small compared to the minimum modulus. So remember, my minimum modulus was like uh, ten to the sixteen, and you might think of p sub zero as being roughly a hundred. So p sub zero is quite small compared to ten to the sixteen, and so I'm looking at very smooth numbers in that range. So the relevant feature is that uh, when p sub zero is small compared to uh, to m, the numbers which are p sub zero smooth are very sparse. So uh, so you're looking at numbers that are like 10 to the 16, all whose prime factors are at most 100. Each prime factor is at most 100. So for instance, one way you could think about it is if uh, I took the three smooth numbers, those would just be the powers of two, and then their density would be sort of essentially one over m at, at size m. So, so this allows me to, um, to initially. In the first stage. 
That's right, in the first stages. So, so I can have number. Uh, I could have numbers like, um, like for instance, uh, fifty-seven times sixty, um, uh, fifty-nine times sixty-one would be would be fine for me, or fifty-nine times sixty-one squared, or, or yeah. But uh, but no prime. For instance, no prime factor like one hundred and one. Yeah, and in this case, there are standard methods from analytic number theory that allow me to estimate. Uh, the sum of the reciprocals of smooth numbers of that nature. And so uh, just sort of standard bounds allow me to con conclude that the density of R sub zero is at least one minus delta for some positive delta. So delta is a parameter that goes into the argument. Just by taking a union bound. OK, so that's the first stage. Uh, the proof now proceeds by induction. So I think of uh, z mod qi plus 1z as fibered over z mod qiz. And I think of the uh, residual set r sub i plus 1 as existing in the fibers over r sub i. And I'll attempt to estimate the density of r sub i plus, on, r sub I plus 1 within individual fibers above r sub i. So uh, I have a schematic of how this works. So you could think that in my initial stage, I had the congruences 0 mod 2, 0 mod 5, and 1 mod 10. And the residual set is the numbers 3, 7, and 9 mod 10. And then um, I'm taking my primes out of order. But uh, suppose I add in the, the congruences 3 mod 18 and uh, 4 mod 15. Then uh, my new q sub i plus 1 would be 90. And, uh, and I'm, I'm so I'm. I'm sieving from, so I, I now have fibers. Um, for instance, uh, 9 mod 10 is a fiber. And I am sieving from, and I'm going to try to estimate the density of that fiber, of the, dense of the fiber 9 mod 10, or yeah, of the fiber 9 mod 10. OK, so uh, when estimating r sub i plus 1 within z mod q sub i plus 1z, over fibers, uh, r sub i plus 1 in a given fiber is de determined by congruences to moduli m, where m divides q sub i plus 1, but m does not divide q sub i. So I've, in the i plus first stage, I've already uh, considered all the moduli that divide q sub i. So I only care about the new ones, the ones that have a, a larger prime factor. So, uh, so each, sub, each such m has a unique factorization as m sub 0 times n where m sub 0 divided q sub i, the previous stage, and where n has all of its prime factors in the interval p sub i up to p sub i plus 1. So, and I'll call the collection of those n uh, the new factors. So those are numbers with all their primes between p sub i and p sub i plus 1. So, um, so I, I'll, I group congruences according to uh, new factor n and fiber r in a set a sub n r. So that's, uh, that's, it lumps together all uh, a sub n mod n, where m has a new factor n. So m is m sub 0 times n, and, uh, and where a sub m is congruent to r mod m 0. And thus, uh, if I look at the fiber r mod qi and the amount that lives into r sub i plus 1, it's uh, the fiber take away the union of all, uh, over all new factors, a sub n r. So, so this is the basic relation to remember. I've grouped, I've grouped my congruences together by new factor. <laughs> OK. So uh, for instance, in my previous example, you could think of the fiber as r, mod, r as 9 mod 10, and as the set end of the set a sub 3 r as uh, the ones that are shown in red. So uh, 19, 49, and 79. So here's a heuristic for how the argument works. The, the main thing that I'll be worried about is the sizes of the sieving sets a sub n r mod n sub n times q, qi. Um, so for each, for each new factor n, and for if, I've, if I average over r and all of z mod qiz and look at the size of that set, it turns out that that's a, that set has a size which has a distribution of mean roughly log of pi. Um, so, and uh, if I if I knew that uh, that um, so if the sieving sets intersected independently, um, 
So, so what's true is that uh, a sub n r is uh, intersects independently with uh, a sub n prime r if n prime and n don't have a common factor. That's a consequence of the Chinese remainder theorem. And so, um, and so if I had complete independence, and if, uh, if all the sieving sets were of size the mean, or as large as they could be, then I could estimate the size of a given fiber with the following product. So it would be a product of 1 minus the size of the sieving set divided by n. That's the size of the event, or the density within the fiber. And it would be roughly this product, which would be uh, which would, I would have a lower estimate for. So, um, so this would allow me to continue the process into the next stage. OK. But of course, if this heuristic held from the first stage, then, uh, then there would be no reason to break the argument into stages. So it's a bit more complicated. OK. So there are two problems with the heuristic. The first is that uh, generally, if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, a pair of new factors, they will have a common factor. That's the generic situation. And then the second difficulty is that uh, as I vary the fiber with an R sub i, R sub i actually becomes pretty small within Z mod QI over time as, I, if, as the sieving increases. And that set is somewhat irregular. So it's just the set that's left behind by the sieve after previous stages. And so um, although I might know the typical behavior of uh, the size of A sub n R average over all Z mod QIZ, uh, it can be rather larger if I average it over the set R sub i. So, so one main difficulty which goes into the argument is, uh, is, uh, is reweighting the set R sub i so that the sieving sets are always under control in distribution. OK. So uh, to address the, uh, the, the difficulty uh, with the lack of independence, I'll use uh, another variant of the Lovaz local lemma, which is as follows. So once again, I consider um, events a sub 1 through a sub n with a dependency graph. And I, uh, I assume that there are weights x sub i between 0 and 1, such that for each i, uh, the probability of a given event is monitored by x sub i times the product over all i, j that are edges, 1 minus x sub j. So you should think of x sub i as being larger than the probability of a sub i. And it's larger by this factor, which uh, controls the amount of dependence at i. So um, this is a product over all the events that, uh, that a sub i potentially depended on. So x sub i will have to be a bit larger than the probability of a sub i. So the same setup as here. I, I have a given event a sub i. Uh, it has edges connecting it to some neighbors. And that's what the product is over. And then it's independent of everything else. OK, and then the conclusion is, um, so I, I call this a relative form of the Lovaz local lemma. And the conclusion is, um, the, the, so I want to estimate the probability of the intersection of the complements. And uh, I have a lower bound. So I, ca I can choose just some of the events and take their probability of their, intersec of their intersection. And then I have a product over the remaining events, 1 minus x of j. And a special case of this is the product over all of them. So, so the bound between the left and the, and the far right is the one that's uh, normally stated. So, uh, but, but in any case, the, uh, the relative form actually follows from the proof. Uh, if it follows. Uh, it doesn't appear in the literature explicitly, but it follows from the standard argument for the local lemma. OK. And the, the relative form will actually play a, an important role in my argument. So, um, so in general, just having a one-sided bound would only be good for the first stage of the argument. And then you would just know that something was non-zero. But knowing that you have a relative form allows you to compare sizes of sets, which allows you to, uh, to end up saying that the set that's left behind is somewhat structured. Which is also a lot more quantitative than the, than the That's true. But, but in any case, this is, this is, uh, uh, this is another the, uh, it's, a, it's a standard uh, method in, in, uh, in, in probabilistic combinatorics. OK. So, um, so in, our, in our context, uh, for, for each r in the residual set at stage i and for each new factor n, uh, sieving by a sub n r mod n qi is an event with probability uh, the size of that set divided by n. And uh, by the Chinese remainder theorem, a valid dependency graph has edges between the n sub i if and only, they have a, if and only if they have a common factor. OK. 
So uh, a crucial feature of our argument is that uh, within good fibers, where um, where the Wolvaz local lemma applies, so that, uh, there's an actual technical definition of what a good fiber is, but uh, but I won't state it for now. Roughly, it means that it's a fiber where the local lemma actually applies. Um, yeah, the relative form of the Wolvaz local lemma also guarantees that the set left over, R mod QI intersect R sub I plus 1, is well distributed in arithmetic progressions in the following sense. So I look at arithmetic progressions to modulus n, where n is a new factor. And I look at the, uh, the maximum size of, uh, I look at the maximum, so I, I, here's my uh, set that's left over, and I look at its intersection with a given arithmetic progression mod n, uh, and uh, I divide it by the, the whole size left over, and it's bounded by, this is essentially a divisor function divided by n. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, this is what I obtained from the relative form of the low vessel column. And so, uh, so, so I, I essentially have soup control on the bias of the regressions as, as a consequence of the sieving process. Okay. So uh, two further ingredients go into the argument. So um, at each stage, I, uh, I'll introduce a pseudo-random measure. So and all the expectations that I need to study are calculated with respect to this measure. And roughly what that measure does is it, uh, it rebiases uh, the, the residual set at each stage so that, it, um, so, to, so that it's better behaved in arithmetic progressions. So in, in this way, I'm, I'm able to ensure that the sieving sets that I sieve by never look too large in distribution. Um, and then uh, the size of the sieving sets are controlled on average with moments, and the moments are all taken with respect to the pseudo-random measure. So, uh, so in particular, so so in this, so it'll be uh, it'll be reweighted um, to depend on. Um, um, it's uniformly distributed in arithmetic progression. So so. Yeah, so it may, yeah, it might be better to say a balancing measure, but um, it, it causes uh, the, set, the set that, that remains, th so, so it's supported on the set that remains, on a subset of the set that remains, and then it's, uh, when you look at its average in arithmetic regressions, it's not very large. So it causes the set that remains to appear more like a uniform set. Uh, yeah, when you average over arithmetic progressions. Okay. All right, so, uh, so that, that's all I'll say about that part of the argument. And then uh, I'll just briefly describe uh, what I've been working on with Pace Nielsen. So it has some interesting features, which I'll talk about. So um, there's an extremal form of the Wolvaz local lemma, which was found by Shearer in the 80s. And uh, Shearer's form of the Wolvaz local lemma, which is tight, is uh, it turns out is related to uh, the partition function of a hard core lattice gas from statistical mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so it's it's the it turns out to be the same thing as the independent set polynomial if you know what that is. Um, so uh, and uh, in the case that we care about, the graph of the partition function has a natural decomposition into quicks indexed by primes. And uh, you can introduce uh, clique variables to the partition function. And if you take the uh, logarithmic derivative of the partition function uh, at the clique variables, that, um, that object has a, uh, it has a, it, it, um, it has a factorization analogous to the way that the Riemann zeta function has a factorization as a uh, product over primes. So the logarithmic derivative ends up being a sum over, uh, over primitive objects called Penrose trees. So normally the partition function itself can be expressed as a, as a sum over, um, over paths in a graph, and, uh, but its logarithmic derivatives can be expressed as uh, tree sums. So what, what is a Penrose tree? It's, um, yeah, so you have uh, your dependency graph, and, uh, and you look at uh, trees contained within the graph, and then there's a notion of primitivity for those trees. So only certain trees appear in the sum when you, when you look at the uh, logarithmic derivative. So all over Penrose? I think it's Roger, but, I'm, Roger. but I can be wrong, okay. so I'm not sure. It can be Oliver, I'm not sure. Okay. 
Uh, so, um, so whereas the original solution used convexity uh, to find the Wolbach's weights, so remember they were a bit larger than the probabilities, and you don't even know they exist a priori. Um, our current f formulation bounds uh, the tree expansions from the partition function um, using a stochastic fixed point equation. And uh, we've also been analyzing the inverse problem of determining sieving sets, which are extremal for the tree expansion. Uh, and we'd like to exploit extra structure in those examples. So those are things that we're working on. I'll just discuss a couple of related problems before I finish. So uh, probably the most famous open problem related to covering systems is a problem about BD sequences. So a BD sequence has a, a pair of real parameters, alpha and beta, where alpha is larger than zero. And it's not an actual arithmetic progression, it's an approximate one. So you look at uh, the fractional part of alpha n plus beta, where uh, n ranges over the positive integers. That's the BD sequence, or not the fractional part, the integer part. And there's a, the most famous open problem in this area is a conjecture of Frankel, which says that uh, if you have at least two BD sequences whose uh, disjoint union is the integers, then uh, the ratio of two of the alphas should actually be an integer. So this is a generalization of uh, the uh, statement that I said about using generating functions about distinct covering systems, uh, exact covering systems. OK. And uh, I should say that. There's work of uh, Schinzel and Ford and Filosetta, among others, showing that um, resolving a problem somewhat easier than the odd covering problem would actually uh, have consequences for deciding the irreducibility of uh, some families of polynomials. So there are, there are some uh, interesting consequences of quantitative results on covering systems. And then one more distantly related problem, so, uh, so our result that I like. So recently there's a, there was a spectacular contribution of probability to number theory uh, resolving the Erdős uh, discrepancy problem due to Terence Dow. So he showed that any function uh, f from the natural numbers to plus or minus 1 has infinite discrepancy. So here the discrepancy is uh, the sum the soup of the sum over, uh, over finite progressions. So you look at the sum of f of jd, where j goes from 1 to n for a given d, uh, and then take the soup over n and d. That's the discrepancy. And he showed that that had to be infinite. So that's, uh, that distinguishes uh, functions which take only value plus or minus 1 from uh, real Dirichlet characters, where that discrepancy can be bounded. Um, that I'm less certain of. Yeah. Your yeah. characters? So. Oh, it, it's unrelated, but I think it's a nice application. So, so um, his proof uses uh, stochastic multiplicative functions, and so, um, which is a current area of active after active research. Um, so. So it's a nice application of probability and number theory. And, uh, and hopefully uh, there will be further applications in the future, and hopefully also applications of the Oklahoma. So thanks for coming.